All right, this is the time where I plug again the two amazing sponsors that made it possible this year uh, because running a conference like that is obviously uh, not possible without the without the, the support of Seven Principles, which is hosting, hosting the conference here, uh, but also without uh, the support of IBM and, and, and the guys from Lotum. So thank you again. And now I, I, I decided to do exactly like Nicolas did. I used checkbox. So checked, checked, checked. And the next one is just here with me, James. We actually already met in, mm -hmm. uh, in San Jose a yep. couple of months ago. And uh, I am lucky that I'm able to see your talk now because when I was at Alconf, I wasn't looking at your talk because I think I was at DubDub or whatever. Yeah. So um, ladies and gentlemen, round of applause for James Majors. Thank you. <laughs> Get this switched over to the correct one. First of all, thanks for coming. Uh, for those of you who came from very far, definitely thank you for coming, because that's, that's a long flight, no matter where. Just to get a gauge of the room, who is new to Swift? OK. Who is new to programming? OK, the, the designer, yeah. <laughs> that helps. All right. So this is not a technical talk. Usually I do technical talks, but this is not one of those. So there's a lot about me in this particular talk. So we'll get a chance to know more about me. Uh, so the one question is, who are you? I'm a father of an amazing little, I call her my three-foot meth head, uh, daughter. Uh, I've been married for a very long time. And I'm a Georgia native, which is important because if you've ever been to Atlanta, you probably haven't realized that 60% of the people there are not from there. So it's a very, very small group of, relatively small group of people who are actually natives. I work for a company called Ingenious Med. We're sort of the other side from what it sounds like the company David works for. We work with what are referred to as hospitalized doctors, not doctors who are in a hospital because something went wrong, but rather they are doctors who work in hospitals. So it sounds like they do a lot of private care, a lot of independent practices. We deal with the doctors who deal with those patients who didn't listen to that doctor in the first place. So what have I done? Um, I started making records in the 80s. Uh, I'm a career changer. So later in life, a few years ago, I decided, you know what? I would much rather see my daughter grow up than make another crappy record for someone who I didn't like or put on another show for another company I really wasn't interested in. So I changed careers, but I had a very long career. I was a freelance engineer for around 20 years. I worked on a lot of pretty high-profile high albums and a whole lot of albums you've never heard of from artists you didn't even know existed. Uh, I owned my own company for about 10 years. I used to rent very high-end equipment to recording studios. I had one of the, well, I had the first digital audio workstation available for rent um, way before anyone realized what they were really good for. I used to produce records and engineer records, so I've done Celtic, jazz, all sorts of acoustic type of instruments. Uh, one time or another, I was a partner in about three or four different studios, depending on how you want to break it down. I've mixed live shows for up to 20,000 people. I have done film and TV, which is a whole other world. I was at one point an adjunct professor at an audio school for about five years. I've done corporate events, private events, everything from Ted Turner's 75th birthday hosted by Jay Leno to, yeah, uh, to Make-A-Wish Foundation galas, YMCA, all sorts of different corporate events. Uh, I spent about four years helping to design, build, and operate a $40 million performing arts center. 
Most importantly, I've never been to prison. Uh, at one point, I've worked for the Olympics. I spent a month in Athens, Greece, back when my hair was much, much longer, and in Beijing when it was even longer then. It doesn't look like it, but my hair actually went halfway down my back. Get a haircut, hippie. So, what do I do now? iOS developer in Genius Med. Uh, it's a product company, so they have really one thing they, they push. I give talks about, mainly about Swift, some about programming, and like this talk about me. I chase my daughter around a lot because, like it says, she's four. Then the question is, all right, why give this talk? What's, what's the point of this particular talk? And like it says, Things are only obvious when they're stated, otherwise they remain a mystery. All right, I just made that up. The point is that this may be the most obvious talk you've ever heard, but the thing is, a lot of these things bear repeating because they often get lost in the shuffle. And as you progress through different parts of your career, and really almost anything, you pick up things that a few years ago, a few months ago, really weren't obvious, but as you take a few steps forward, you're like, yeah, why didn't I see that? It is not because I are a curmudgeonly old man, uh, although at times I can be. And it was funny to see David's uh, presentation because any good presentation has to have a Venn diagram. <laughs> uh, while he used art and science, I used art and technology, and my intersection I refer to as magic. <laughs> because that is probably the best way to describe it. Is I made records for a really long time and to create an environment where an artist can do their thing, the thing they are best at, the thing that wakes them up in the morning can truly be magical. It doesn't happen a lot and boy howdy I can tell you stories of sitting and listening to something for a week that never got used because it was just that bad. But I have also had those rare times where you're like, all of this was worth it because I got to record that. <coughs> and other people are going to get to hear that. So a little background, and this is the, uh, this is the 10 cent tour of what recording is. Basic idea, take a bunch of different microphones, put them all over different things, Guitars, amplifiers, drum set, vocalist, keyboards, all sorts of stuff. And you combine it down to left and right, stereo, or surround if you're doing film. So it's a really a matter of taking all these disparate parts, cramming them together, and trying to make something unique and interesting about it. This is a drum set. Probably didn't surprise anyone. In this picture, there are 12 microphones. No, we're not going to look at each individual one. Just trust me on that one. But the point is, you want this to sound like a drum set, not 12 individual microphones on a drum set. It's kind of tricky. This is four microphones. This is actually four microphone test. If, if you did this in one of my sessions, you were going to get thrown out because you're not putting four mics on a guitar. That's just not happening. But the point is, you would have to take however many mics you used, and make it sound like a cohesive whole, something that you would hear if you were just standing there. Then you take all that and you make it sound like, oh, maybe a group performing on a roof, if that's the vibe they want. Or maybe a group playing in a stadium, if that's the vibe they want. Or a little intimate situation where it sounds like you're sitting in the middle of the band, you can hear everything if that's what you want. So you take all these things, you record them, you massage them, you create a picture. It De just depends on what picture you're trying to create. Well, how does that relate to code? Well, as programmers, developers, we take something like this and we turn it into something like that. We use that technology and we use our ability to be creative, to be adaptive, 
to create something magical. A uh, guy I used to work with described programming as having a superpower because you can do so much with it that is really cool that your average person just does not comprehend. Making records is a lot like that, although, you know, on MTV it looks a hell of a lot more glamorous than it really is. Now let's look at how things have changed over the years between making records, being an audio engineer, and being a programmer or software developer. This oddly staged photo is uh, supposed to be, and it is actually, Abbey Road Studios in London. Notice the lab coats? The engineers in Abbey Road Studios actually wore lab coats up until the early 80s. This was a very scientific endeavor. This was all about being an electrical engineer. This is not a stage photo. This is an actual photo from a Beatles recording session. The guy in front is a guy named Norman Smith. He was the first, he, did, he engineered the first Beatles records. The guy on the right, that is Sir George Martin, the producer of the Beatles. Notice that he is wearing an outfit very similar minus the lab coat to the guys on the left. And if you look real close, this is something that would never happen in most modern recording studios. Norman's sitting there with a cigarette at the console. That would throw some people I know into fits. But the guy in the background, that's the assistant engineer. Notice the tie. It was a very formal thing. You were not going to hang out and make a rock and roll record. You were coming to work, you were clocking in, you were going to make a recording, you were going to balance it, you were going to send it on, and then you went home. These gentlemen are responsible for the Apollo guidance system. Notice how similar their outfit is to the previous picture? Yeah. Um, I just love this ad. It's funny that it's an actual IBM ad. Like 150 extra engineers. Yeah, that's, that's what a computer was replacing. So the technology has changed considerably as well. In 1984, a company called New England Digital put together a system called the Synclavier. This was a system that did synthesis, it did sampling, later on it did hard disk recording. Um, it ran off a Mac 2 and later a Mac 2 FX with a new bus. This system would only set you back minimum $100,000. Fully loaded, you were looking about a quarter of a million dollars, and it could record eight tracks of audio. The, uh, above the keyboard, those four black squares are Winchester drives. They were probably 300 megs apiece. By way of comparison, a little bit later, a company called Akai got together with a guy, Roger Lynn, who made one of the first drum machines came out with the MPC, the MIDI Production Center. This did sampling. I think a whopping uh, 13 seconds, fully maxed out, which meant you spent another thousand dollars on memory. And you combine this with a turntable. You just invented hip hop, rap, most of the genres that we have today. So a guy could put together $2,000 and buy one of these. Nowadays, I can get the software, the fully blessed version of a Synclavier for $199 and run it on my Mac, and it has far more capabilities than they ever dreamed of. If you happen to have an iPad, instead of spending $2,000, you can spend the priestly sum of $12.99 to now have an MPC. So by way of comparison, again, this is your sort of standard recording studio. It's a solid state logic console, it's 56 inputs, probably cost about a million dollars brand new, um, late 80s, early 90s. Then you have all the outboard gear, speakers. You know, you're looking at minimum of a million dollars to get this up and running. I can do the same thing on my laptop in logic. And what is logic, 299? 
and it comes with a bunch of samples and a bunch of processors. And if you don't suck, you can do a whole record and no one will know or care. And again, hey, look, another IBM. You know, I can just imagine these ladies enjoying themselves and, you know, in their spare time running pi out to 500 digits and being excited about that. Notice the power panel in the back. I love that. The shutoff. It wasn't a switch. It was a <coughs> off. Nowadays, you carry a supercomputer in your pocket. The amount of processing, the raw processing power available in your pocket is unfathomable. There are now producers who do records that are hits, that are recorded, the basics are recorded on their iPhone, and then they transfer it over in a recording studio, and then they do all the other stuff. So audio programming have run a very similar path and have been changed in very similar ways by technology and the acceptance of, well, you don't have to be an electrical engineer to be an audio engineer. You don't have to be an electrical engineer to be a programmer. I mean, there's not a person in there that's even wearing a tie, you know? It's a, it's a brave new world. And it even goes so far as the most commonly used programming languages in the world and we're not going to have the discussion about if HTML is a programming language. <laughs> oh, I heard that. <laughs> but this is what most applications, most software is written in. Why? Because it runs on anything that has a browser. So anyone who has access to anything with a browser, which could be a refrigerator, can fire up HTML and program in it. Wouldn't recommend it, but you can. So it's gotten to the point that you don't really need anything to make a record. You don't really need anything to learn how to program. So it's very, very different. It's not a matter of it's, is it better or worse. It doesn't matter. That's not the question. It's that it's different. So I want to share a few lessons that I've learned in my long career in audio. Number one, and we'll get into each one of these in turn, talent is overrated. Let that one sink in. Second, it's not the gear, it's the ear. Third, no one buys the album because of the mic the singer used. Fourth, nothing is sacred. Five, you can't fix it in the mix. Probably a phrase that doesn't make sense, but it will in a minute. <laughs> First, talent is overrated. So in the 2008 book, oddly named Talent is Overrated, what really separates world-class performance from everyone else by a guy named Jeff Colvin, he sort of lays out that forget about talent, what really matters are three things. Deliberate practice, intrinsic motivation, and starting early. So if you look at people who are viewed as being talented, oh, that's just a natural gift. That's a God-given talent. Blah, blah, blah. You know what? It's not. Have you ever met someone who sat down at a computer and wrote a program without ever looking at other code, at the documentation, at a YouTube video. Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, no. Because it doesn't happen. It's something you learn. You may be familiar with someone who's like, oh, that person's an amazing singer. You wanted to hear the first time they sang? Probably not. Or that person's an amazing guitar player. You don't know about the hours and hours and hours they spent sounding really bad in their own private world before anyone ever heard them and said, oh, they're pretty good. You know, we look at people like, one example is Jimi Hendrix. There's, all, there's a lot of stories about him just walking around all day with a guitar in his hands playing. No matter what he did, he was there with the guitar. 
And that's not a unique story for amazing guitar players. Deliberate practice, it's a little trickier. Practice things you don't know, not the stuff you do. Spend more time learning and being uncomfortable and trying and failing than just being like, oh, well, I know the C scale. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, congratulations, that's not a song. Intrinsic motivation, you can't rely, or people who are very successful or viewed as talented don't rely on some sort of external motivation. I'll pay you, I'll beat you if you don't. Any of those things. It comes from inside, it's something they have to do. It's, I, I have been fortunate to meet some musicians that the reason they get up in the morning is to create music. And it's not something they say, it's something you see inside them. They're like, it's just like breathing to me. I have to do it. I can't stop myself from doing it. I have to. And they're the ones that put the effort in. They practice, they make mistakes, they try. Because it's inside of them somehow. And a lot of them, yeah, they started early. That's not to say that if you didn't start as a five-year-old, you'll never be amazing at something. It just means that the sooner you get to work, the better off you're going to be. So, how do you improve your skills? Good question. You have a bald man stare at you menacingly. <laughs> you practice. You do it over and over and over. So, there's a story from a book called Art and Fear where at the beginning of a semester, in a pottery class, the art teacher says, okay, we're going to cut the, divide the class in two. This side of the class will be graded on pure weight. The more you do, the better your grade will be. This side will be graded on one piece. You have the entire semester to make one piece. Now I pose the question, at the end of the semester, generally speaking, who were the better artisans? Pottery makers? I don't know what the correct term is. I made records. Who made better work? The ones who did it over and over and over and over and over. Why? Because they made mistakes. They threw it away, they learned. They made another mistake. They threw it away, they learned. They didn't concern themselves with just the theory. They didn't sit around contemplating their navels about, oh, what would be the best thing to make? What would really express myself as an artist? No. They made a pot. They went, eh, that sucks. They threw it away. They made another one. Lather, rinse, repeat. When I, when I was teaching in an audio school, one thing I would tell my students is make your mistakes here. Make sure your mistakes wind up in your trash can. Because if they don't, they're going to wind up in your clients. And that's not where you want them to be. Do it over and over and over. And when you think you've done it too much, you probably just start it. That comes to software. We often consider we have to make something big. Oh, well, I won't really know how this works until I make a huge application out of it. Well, it's not really true. Make little mistakes. Throw them away. Try something. Doesn't work? Cool. Throw it away. We make software. We make things of thought. You type it in. Doesn't work. Oh, my fingers are so tired. No. It's not like you went out and, I'm going to get a piece of marble. I'm going to chisel it out. I'm going to sand it down. That looks like crap, and I just spent three years. Okay, well... That sucks. No, you spend 15 minutes, you spend an hour. You throw it away, get on with life. Next. It's not the gear, it's the year. In layman's terms, it's not the tools, it's your ability. So, this is the Task M144, a cassette four track. Yeah, those things existed. <laughs> Originally released in the late 70s, this is a $1,200 device, which for the time was expensive, but for a four-track recorder was cheap. 
This is a Shure SM57. It's considered to be the desert island microphone. If anything ever goes wrong and you need to build a shelter, you can use that thing for a hammer. <laughs> oh, and then you can make a recording with it. I've never built a house with it, but I have driven nails with one, I swear to God. <laughs> and you can defend yourself. Um, this combination was used to make a lot of records and you didn't realize it. Bruce Springsteen's album, Nebraska, was recorded on one of these and two of those. The first Wu-Tang Clan album was recorded on one of these. Ween, several other groups that I, uh, Weird Al, Weird Al Yankovic, personal, personal uh, hero of mine, has done albums on these. Why? Because it's not the gear that matters. It's their ability. It's that they actually had something to say that was worth listening to. They used a setup that most people today would be like, I can't make a record on that. And they made records. That sold. That launched careers. This is not someone compensating. <laughs> he actually uses this gear. This is a guy named Jack Joseph Poig. He's kind of the 1% in the mixing world. Uh, there's gear in there that I've never actually physically touched, only seen. It's, it's an amazing collection. But this guy, you take all that away, he's still going to give you an amazing sounding record. It just happens that he has the money and the gumption to go find all these old pieces. Something unique for him. Other people in that situation, it's not going to turn out well. I don't know what the German equivalent of Crayola is. It may be Crayola, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is the 96. When I was growing up, I, I never had more than 16. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Please, si single tier. Uh, but if you give this to someone who doesn't know what they're doing, you get something like that. Which, if it's your child, I'm very proud of them. Put it on the refrigerator, it's a work of art. If you paid someone to produce this, <laughs> you're sure gonna be pissed, right? Because it's not the number of crayons. You could get the 128, I just couldn't find a good picture of it. And be like, I have every color ever. Well, it doesn't matter, because if you suck, you suck. Conversely, if you give someone a pencil and they know what they're doing, they produce something like that. That is not a photograph. That's a pencil drawing. That's someone who has drawn a lot of crap and gotten it out of their system and is now making things that are amazing. The first time they picked up their Crayolas probably looked a lot like that last picture. But they didn't stop. And they got better. And they got better and they got better. But it takes a lot of effort. Some people will look at the language they use as being this amazing tool. Oh, yes, I swear to God, Hodor exists. You can look it up. <laughs> the, and, and what's the only keyword in the entire language? <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, I've, I forget how I came across that, but I had to put it in. So some people will look at, oh, well, if I was only using this language, oh, if I was only using this framework, oh, if I was only using whatever, my app wouldn't have sucked. <laughs> no, it would have sucked in a different language. <laughs> You've got to stop thinking that the tools are what's important. It's your ability to use the tool. You will never hear a carpenter being like, man, if I only had a screwdriver, that house wouldn't have sucked. <laughs> or if only I had the most recent hammer, I really could have built something nice. No. It's a tool. They're going to be like, I need a hammer to do this job. I need a saw to do this job. It's just tools. Although I don't think Hodor is really a tool. <laughs> so... Number three, no one buys the album because of the mic the singer used. What do I mean by that? This, 
beautiful specimen is a Norman U-47, built uh, just after World War II, uses a very weird tube, valve, amazing sounding microphone. You've probably seen it used by, hey look, it's the Beatles. If I use this microphone, will I sound like the Beatles? Hey look, it's Frank Sinatra. If I use this microphone, will I sound like Frank Sinatra? Yeah, I think you probably know what the answer to that is. No, you'll sound like you through a U-47. If you sound good, you sound good. If you sound bad, you sound bad singing through a U-47. That microphone, if you can get one in good shape, is going to cost you anywhere from ten to $15,000 nowadays. Oh, wait, it gets worse. So this is a Telefunken LM251. <coughs> this is considered to be the holy grail of tube microphones. Um, if you can get one of these in good shape, it's going to cost you a minimum of $15,000. I have used both 47s and 251s. Yes, they are absolutely amazing sounding mics. They make people who sound good sound amazing. And they make people who sound bad sound worse. <laughs> Yes, it is. That, see, that's that combination of art and technology. Hey, look, it's Bruce Springsteen singing into a 251. Will I sound like... No. No, you'll sound like you through a really expensive microphone. No one that I know has ever been like, man, that would have really been a really good album if the singer had used this microphone. No. Said no one ever. The reality is, these two microphones are generally used on more records than the other two. That's a Shure SM7B. Yeah, set you back 350 bucks. It's kind of the big brother of the 57. And a 58, which is like the sibling. 100 bucks. You can also drive nails with that one. These mics are used for more vocals on more records than the others. And you know what? I don't think anyone in this room has ever been like, eh, it would have been better if they used a 251. No. It's not these tools. If you're dealing with something good, it's up to you. Don't start talking again about, and don't think I'm against frameworks, I'm really not. I don't want to be known as like the framework bashing guy, especially since we have Couture in the middle and they're across here. Um, these are all good frameworks, but if you don't understand this tool, luckily you won't blow your leg off or something like that, but you're going to write code that is hard to reason, hard to use, hard to refactor. You're going to wind up attaching yourself to a framework where maybe you shouldn't have. You're going to pull a framework in that does 50 times more things than you really need it to. Whereas if you spend a little bit more time understanding the concepts, a lot of times you don't need a framework. Or you'll be able to use a framework more effectively and in a way that doesn't hobble you later on. And again, no user has ever said, man, if they'd used Alamo Fire, that would have been a great application. No. They don't know or care. All right. Numero four. Nothing is sacred. Now, what do I mean by this? So, Jack Joseph Puey, the guy with, that was not compensating earlier on, uh, tells a story about when he was coming up, working with a guy named Glenn Johns, who used to do uh, Led Zeppelin. He, he's like one of those god figures. Jack was working with him, and he'd spent a lot of time trying to get a guitar sound. Uh, well, the engineer walks in, looks him straight in the eye, kicks it over. And he needs to say he's a little pissed by that. The guy says, what's the big idea? I mean, you just did it. Do it again and do it faster. Chances are it'll actually be better. To which he set about, he just kind of set it up, gave it a quick listen, and yes, it was better. So it wasn't like oh, we'll never get a better guitar sound because I spent all this time, you know, I did a quadratic equation to determine the optimal frequency, you know. No. You overthought it. And doing it again was probably the best thing you could do. A lot of people 
treat their code like this. You know, as if you have written the Ten Commandments, you have written a beautiful verse, you're, Lord, you're the Lord Byron of Swift, <laughs> and you're not, okay? Your guard statement ain't that amazing. <laughs> so get over it. In the world of the SSL console, the big thing I showed you earlier, this is what's called Total Recall, not the bad movie. This was a big feature for them. They, they were the first company to put a computer running an 8088 in a console that could record the position of every switch and knob on the console. Then it would play it back. So then you could see, it's a little hard to see, but notice how there's two lines here. One is the current position of the knob. The other is where it should be. So you could go back and it takes time to reset the entire console. Of course, later on, they actually made it a little more photorealistic and a little easier to read. All the yellow dials, all the circles, are showing you where the knob should be. You do a mix, you record everything, you document everything, you don't like it, recall it, and fix it. It's kind of like version control. Remember that? Yeah, you don't like it? Revert, create a new branch, toss a branch completely. It's, you didn't build a building. You wrote a few lines of code. You typed in a few things. Ooh, my fingers are tired. Just do it again. Do it better. It's not a sin. I mean, get, greatest thing ever. And last, you can't fix it in the mix. All right, so the general process for making a record is you do your basic tracks, right? So you do your drums, your bass, any foundation that you're going to build on. Then you start adding other things to it. You add your guitars, your solos, all the other junk, sound, you know, sound effects, blah, blah, blah. Then you do vocals, background vocals, everything that goes with it. That's your tracking and overdubs. You then take all those tracks, you sit at a console, and you combine all of that into a stereo mix, left and right. So you take all those pieces and you mix them together. It's kind of like making a cake, although less tasty. You take all these ingredients and you make something amazing out of it. That's the idea. This is a very famous comic from uh, uh, Farside, yes, thank you. The knob he's turning? Suck. On this console, of which there are, and this is not an exaggeration, over 10,000 knobs and switches, this is actually the control room of the Performing Arts Center that I designed. Not a single one of them says unsuck. You can, I cannot decrap by pressing a button. Done work. If you bring me something that's bad, I can't polish that turd. Well, I, unless I freeze it first. But if it's bad to begin with, I can't make something amazing from it. It's just not going to happen. There aren't any tools in there that are going to be like, desuckify this song, or make this singer actually sound like they know what they're doing. There's a, I can do a lot, I, and I have done a lot, sometimes much to my chagrin, but if you deliver a song to me that is just not a good song, or wasn't recorded well, wasn't played well, there's really not much I can do. Just like if you write code, and really all you're doing is writing bugs and technical debt, there's really not much you can do. You're going to have to fix these things. You can't, as they say, continue to kick the can down the road. It's, you can't make something amazing from crap. 
take the time to do it right the first time. And you'll actually find that doing it right the first time, while you may think takes longer, actually takes less time. Because doing something wrong and then redoing it takes a lot longer than slowing down and just doing it right the first time. How many times have you thrown something together because you've got to meet a deadline? Oh, I'll fix it later. Yeah. Yeah, keep telling yourself that. Yeah, I'll lose that weight. Yeah, I'll stop being a jerk. Yeah, I'll call my mom. No, you're not. Don't lie. Just accept the truth. I'm going to write this bug, and it's going to sit there. Or I'm going to explain to my manager, myself, my spouse, that I need to take the time and correct this. Because otherwise, I'm going to be building a very, very shaky foundation, and it's just going to get worse. So you can't put lipstick on a pig. OK, you can, but you don't want to kiss it. It's still a pig. Don't let that be your approach. Well, it sucks now, but hopefully it'll suck a little less later, because it's not going to. It's going to compound with interest. So what have we learned here today? One, talent is overrated. This also explains the whole uh, imposter syndrome. I've dealt with a lot of people who are really good, put the work in, and they continue to put the work in because they were afraid someone would realize they're not that good. But they actually were. It's not the gear, it's the air. Stop worrying yourself with languages, with frameworks, with all that crap, because it doesn't matter. You and your ability and the effort you put into it are what matter. No one buys the album for the mic the singer used. Your users want to use their software, your software, and get on with their lives. They want it to work. They don't care if it was written in basic. They really don't. They want a problem solved in a way that doesn't make them want to put a gun in their mouth and then get on with their life. Stop worrying about things that you think are important that actually aren't that important. Nothing is sacred. If it isn't right, do it over. What you did is not that amazing. And if what you did is really clever, you probably did it wrong. Because I, I personally hate clever. So taking that one piece of code that you're so proud of that takes only one line when it really should take four because the guy coming after you is going to have to read it and figure out what the hell you are doing, it's not that sacred. Unroll it, make it easier to read, get on with it. Four, you can't fix it in the mix. You cannot unscrew yourself. There is no magic framework to make your app suck less. you got to do the work. And thanks for listening. All right, thank you very much. So I get that SM58, so now if, if anybody has a nail, I can try. You laugh, I've done it. But yeah, I was thinking about this because I actually, I, ha I had this microphone, which is mine, since I don't know, 15 years, 20 years, and it won't die. Um, but I've never tried with nails. Um, You're missing out. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so um, question? Anyone? I'm going to have to walk around to you um, by any means. And if you don't have a question right now, keep it for the panel anyway. Uh, because the next uh, talk is going to be the panel, so it's going to take us a little bit of time to set up the, the, um, uh, the chairs here and whatnot. And uh, actually, we're going to take a little bit more of time, so it's cool if you stay a little bit more outside until whatever quarter, to, uh, quarter past uh, four hours in the languages. It's, it's terrible. Every language is different. Sorry. Let's, let's, let's say 4.15. We should all, always say like our minutes in every language. All Germans agree, right? Like, fünf vor zwölf. 
Anyways, um, yeah, so um, thank you again, and uh, let's see in the panels. I would have questions for for you and all the other okay. people in the panels anyway. And by the way, for the speakers panel, is, every, is, is every speaker, is the one from today, but also the ones from tomorrow. So uh, see you in a few minutes, like 20 minutes or something, right? Bye.